Hello, I'm Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Making the Case for NoSQL, sponsored today by Tengen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If your in goes to full screen mode and you want to ask a question, just move your mouse to the top of the screen. You will see a toolbar drop down. On the far right is a down arrow that will produce a box to pop up. At the box is a Q&A icon for you to click on. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Graham Naray. Graham is a product mar marketing manager at Tengen, supporting initiatives in product marketing and alliances. Prior to joining Tengen, he was a senior business analyst at CSMG, a boutique management consulting firm specializing in the high-tech and telecom industries. Lucky to have him with us today, and with that, I will give the floor to Graham. Hello and welcome. Thanks for having me today. Let's get started. So, I'm going to be talking about um, making the case for NoSQL, and I'd like to start off with um, a bit of an analogy. Um, so, think of uh, relational databases, I think kind of like landline telephones. This is a technology that's been around for several decades. It's reliable. Uh, we understand how they work. We know what they're what they're good for, um, and, and they're pretty ubiquitous. Um, but when you look at what's happening in terms of development today, right? The advent of wireless technology and smartphones um, has shifted uh, what you're developing. So when you look at development, it's happening on mobile applications. It's, it's the reason for that, because the advent of smartphones has opened up a whole new realm of what's possible. This is said for relational databases and NoSQL databases. Relational databases have been around for several decades. It's reliable technology. We know how they work, and we understand uh, where they're great, what, what their limitations are. Um, when NoSQL databases came onto the scene just you know, several years ago, uh, they opened up a whole new realm for what's possible in terms of application development. So while today I'll walk you through a number of the um, components of the context of you know how we got here and, and why is NoSQL around and you know, why should um, why are organizations using NoSQL today? Um, really, I think the most important thing, the most salient thing, is really that applications and smartphones, um, you know, relative to landlines, this has opened up a whole new realm of what's possible in terms of application development and deployment. So, um, so next, how we build and run applications has, has changed. Things like agile development and the use of cloud computing and all that. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and so, uh, the 21st century, some leading web pioneers said, hey, we need a new database that can handle these new needs. Um, and what came out with essentially was um, a, a new genre of databases that is now termed NoSQL databases. Um, these databases are now available to, um, to uh, external organizations that are being sold by companies like ours, like Tengen uh, with MongoDB, but other there are a whole host of other ones like Cassandra and HBase and Couchbase um, and, and um, Neo4j, lots of other ones. We'll go into a little bit of, of uh, how these factors have come into play. That's sort of the, the broad scope context. Um, and a database uh, is really only as good as the impact that it has on, on the person using it. So. Um, that I think are really special about what NoSQL databases can do for your business are in the realm of enabling new applications that, that were possible before, improving customer satisfaction, uh, making it much easier and faster to, to get products to market, and overall just reducing your cost structure. We'll, we'll talk about some stories um, later on in the presentation about how organizations are using NoSQL databases to achieve these goals. 
quick overview of the agenda. We'll talk about what's changed, how did we get to where we are, uh, how does NoSQL address um, the current state of things and the challenges faced by relational databases. And I'll tell you some stories about some of the cooler things that companies are doing with relational da um, NoSQL databases today. To start, relational database, um, for those of you out there who are you know, less technical, just a, a little brief introduction, relational database is kind of like a spreadsheet. So here we've got a table, um, it's got some first names, some last names, and, and a city, and then there's a unique identifier that column all the way on the left, person ID. We want to have a database and we're going to store a bunch of people, we're going to store the city they live in, we're going to store the cars they own. So we have this person table over here, then we have another table for cars have their entities and their models and their years and all that stuff, but they're linked by this person ID, which you see here in the second table, is come all the way right. Those are relations. The relations are linking one table to another. This is why we call it a relational database. Some things have changed um, that now make it uh, a little bit more challenging to use relational databases in some new contexts. So, um, imagine that all of a sudden you start wanting to add more data, different types of data to your database and you have uh, way more rows and way more columns, and all of a sudden, lots of relationships, lots of rows, big complexity. So, uh, what you're seeing here is obviously an exaggerated example of what can happen, um, but this sort of, uh, of the, the picture to illustrate um, how NoSQL databases came into play. So, really five things have changed, and we'll go into each of these in detail. But to start, uh, so it's been an increase in the variety of data that we store and ingest. In which we ingest the data and the rate at which it changes, that's increased as well. Obviously, the volume of data has increased. We go about uh, developing apps has changed, and the way that we go about deploying apps has changed. These five factors, these are the key drivers um, that uh, lead us to uh, Relational databases are not always a good fit for applications today, and NoSQL can help address those challenges. So for data variety. It used to be that when relational databases came around, that the prime, you know, the, the types of transactions or, or queries or, or applications that they would have to support were relatively structured. A retail transaction, we know that it has certain fields. It's got a cost, it's got a data, it's got a location, a uh, telephone call. Uh, has you know a person and a phone number and you know a connecting phone number and a set of switches that it goes through. It's all very very structured. And so they capture in a relational database, which is basically as we discussed, like a spreadsheet. Um, uh, however, today we're storing all new types of data. We're storing just structured data, which would fit very nicely in a table. We're also storing semi-structured data. We're in structured data, like a tweet or a like. There's no there's no structure to that or a blog post. We're seeing polymorphic data, so lots of different types of data in the same in the same place. We're seeing sensor data and stream data and different mobile applications and um, and all kinds of other sources. And just imagine trying to model that. Imagine trying to model um, everything on Facebook in a relational database. I mean, if, even if the volume were small, the complexity would be so great that, that that's really challenging to do. So data is is one of the major challenges. Um, posed against relational databases today. Second challenge is data velocity. It used to be that um, the rate at which we would query a database or add new data to a database was, was relatively stable um, and predictable, if nothing else. Um, if it were to increase, we kind of knew why it would increase and when it might increase, and it wasn't necessarily that, that great. Um, nowadays, data is uh, changing and being ingested just extremely fast. So, you know, imagine all of the um, uh, internal logs, uh, click streams, sensors, online systems, social media, all kinds of channels, the data being ingested so fast, um, that's a challenge for a, a relational database to handle. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is the case later on. But velocity, another major challenge. Volume. So, uh, Tip for a relational database needs to be stored on a single server. 
there is a limit to how big a server can get. And certainly big servers get very expensive. Um, so what you're seeing here actually on the left is um, an example of an IBM uh, IBM 3380 from 1980 was the size of a refrigerator, weighed 550 pounds, and cost $40,000 back then, which is roughly equivalent to like $110,000 now. That means stored 2.5 gigs of data, or more than 2.5 gigs on my thumb drive. So today, we're storing gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes, and that's because the data is not just coming from a growing number of users, it's coming from a growing number of devices and an increase in engagement. And it's hard to store all that data on one machine. So the challenge, how do we get this data onto multiple machines and still make it work? Absolutely. It used to be, in your generalizations, but it used to be that um, folks would use um, something called the waterfall method. Maybe they develop an application over a period of six months, 12 months, 18 months. They develop things in sequence. They'd spend a bunch of time up front planning the, the schema, the design of the days. And the changes, they would do it every so often, not consistently. And the reason is that if you want to add a column or change a column or pivot a table in some way, that's actually tough. It's not just tough um, to figure out how that should work, uh, but it's also tough to implement because you need to make that change in a few different places, not just in the database, but also at the application layer, and then also in an intermediary layer called the ORM, or the Object Relational Mapping. Oftentimes, it can actually just take time to execute that change. Like, you, it needs to populate through the database, um, which can require database downtime and all these other complications. Well, today, folks are, are using agile development. They're pushing code every, every week, every month, every quarter, um, and they need to be able to make those changes uh, in a way that the database isn't the blocker for them. So it's hard uh, for folks to make those kinds of changes and, and um, with that kind of agility and frequency using relational databases. A lot of deployment. So I said uh, it used to be um, you know, for relational databases, you got to store all this on one server. Um, one of the main reasons why is um, if you remember all those relations, if you've got all those tables, right, and um, you want to uh, serve some kind of query, you know, tell you about Bob's, you know, Bentley that's stored in London, or what you need to pull data from multiple tables. Um, and if you didn't have all that data on a single machine, it would just take a really long time to do it. Pretty simply reason as to why typically with a relational database, you want to have all your data on one machine. Well, it's hard to take all that work if you want to spread it across multiple machines, but today, organizations are exploring how they can leverage cloud and flies infrastructure. And in this case, they're not using one single big machine. They're using lots of small, smaller commodity hardware or, or virtual machines um, being set out and the relational database's lack of compatibility with that type of architecture um, poses, uh, poses a challenge um, in terms of how do you reconcile you know, the, the, the desire to move towards these new cloud and virtualized infrastructures with um, making it work with a legacy technology like a relational database. And just a summary, what's, what's changed? Um, we said that there's been a massive increase in the variety of data that we're storing. Uh, an increase in the rate at which we uh, ingest that data and the rate at which it changes. Obviously, the increase in data volume is massive. Developing apps um, in new ways, faster, um, and in a more agile fashion than we ever used to before. And we're deploying apps across new architectures. What are the challenges that drove uh, that bring us to SQL? Enter NoSQL. A bit of context. The primary difference between a relational database and NoSQL database is in the data model. So I said before that a relational database is kind of like a spreadsheet. That's what you have on your left. On the right, 
we have different NoSQL database models. Now, there are different flavors, the most popular of which is the document-oriented model. And in this case, rather than storing data in rows and columns, you store it in a document. Not like a document or a PDF or something like that, but a special type of document. In the case of uh, our black MongoDB, it's a JSON document. And you can think of a document as being kind of like a row, and each document has these fields, and those fields are kind of like columns. In this case, you might have a document for every person on that table that you have over to your left. So that's that's one uh, NoSQL database model. There are a few others, key value stores, wide column stores, graph databases. Um, all of them have uh, various places and trade-offs, the most popular of which um, right now is the document model, so we're going to spend some time talking about that. And one of the reasons that it's so popular is because what, what, what they've done They've taken the scalability and the performance of, of NoSQL. NoSQL tried to address about some of these things, we were, some of those challenges we were talking about before. But they've kept the rich functionality of relational databases. So they took what's great about NoSQL databases, but they didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The reasons why document databases have been so possible, uh, so popular. So let's talk about why. Um, Databases uh, generally uh, or generally can help address some of the challenges that we discussed earlier. So, um, for these, I'm going to give you an example. Of some interesting things that uh, customers of ours, uh, users of MongoDB, uh, are, are doing uh, uh, with the data. So, we said um, we're now not just using structured data. We're pulling kinds of new data. There's a Fortune 100 retailer. I, I can't disclose the name, but this is you know a household name that that everyone knows. They're doing some really interesting things around retail price optimization. They're not just pulling in their own pricing data. They want to pull in competitive pricing data, but their competitors obviously don't give them the data in some kind of spreadsheet. They have to go crawling for it. So from a variety of different sources, some of it structured, some of it not. They pull in uh, unstructured data from social media to conduct sentiment analysis to figure out. Uh, what products are hot and which products are not. And they're doing all this in real time. MongoDB's document model um, is is flexible and not read in the way that the relational database is, and as such allows them to pull in all this, these different types of data into one single database. It's really powerful because they're doing real-time pricing optimization, which is important, really important for the retailers out there that are trying to figure out, hey, how do I compete with M on an eBay? and other web companies that have different cost structures than me. This is an example of how a company is using MongoDB to handle the problem of data variety. Data velocity. Um, generated data is probably the best example of how um, data velocity is increasing it. And machine-to-machine -machine communication um, is probably one of the more interesting spaces. Um, so machine-to-machine -machine data uh, refers uh, machine to machine communication refers to products and services in which you have a machine that um, captures or generates some sort of uh, signal or piece of information, sends it to some other machine or central system, which then makes some kind of decision based on that data. So, for instance, um, it could be an inventory manager. The you know machine says, says, okay, you've run out of inventory, sends something to some central repository, which says, hey, we've run out of inventory, time to restock. That would be kind of a simple example. Uh, so, Telefonica um, is a MongoDB user, uh, and they are using MongoDB um, to power a machine-to-machine -machine platform that's capturing sensor data capable of capturing over 10 billion readings per customer for things like um, heart meters and fleet tracking and all kinds of interesting use cases. This is something that previously really may have been possible technologically with a relational database, but actually totally infeasible even if it would have been actually technologically possible. So really, um, this is you know ma making something possible that wasn't really possible before. Um, and because MongoDB uses a scale-out model, this is what makes uh, this application something feasible. So the MongoDB is addressing the data velocity problem. Um, Craigslist stores billions of posts per day. Uh, they use MongoDB, their original deployment, this is the original deployment years ago. It had 5 billion documents, um, over 10 billion terabytes, growing every single day. Uh, with a relational database trying to squeeze all that, 
onto one machine um, was, you know, next to impossible. Um, trying to manage spreading it out over multiple machines was a total headache and a nightmare. Um, Mongi again with a scale out model, um, uh, you know, NoSQL databases provided. That's what made this possible for Clis to address its data volume problem. And so we said um, organizations are interested in, in being agile, uh, put features and, and new products uh, to market quickly and iteratively. Mailbox is a phenomenal example. Some may be familiar. Mailbox is a is an innovative take on. Um, a mobile email application kind of treats your email as like a dynamic to-do list and allows you to do things like snooze emails for later and um, prioritize them in different ways. Mailbox, which was recently acquired by Dropbox, had an absolutely explosive growth uh, where within the first 10 weeks they scaled to over a million users. And they wanted to do was continue to push new versions of the app to keep improving. They run on MongoDB, and they actually push three separate versions of the app within the first 10 weeks of launching, each of which you know, featured hundreds of bug fixes and new features. So this is incredible because it was able to respond to the, to the need of its users very quickly. That, that would have been really challenging with a relational database because of what we discussed before around needing to, uh, how it can be challenging to add columns and, and migrate data from one schema to another. Uh, but with MongoDB, which has a, a dynamic or a flexible schema, flexible game model, that type of agility was possible. Employment. We said uh, lots of organizations are looking for ways that they can leverage cloud and virtualized infrastructures. We have a tier one investment bank. Which I also can't share, but also uh, you know a household name that that everyone's familiar with, um, and that 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 bank is looking to empower its everyone in its business across a variety of different business units to get apps to market fast in, in an agile manner. What it's doing to to make that possible is it's creating a platform as a service with MongoDB, where it's really going to make MongoDB available as a service to every business unit within the organization so that they can just spin up instances of MongoDB and get going with their development. This is because not only does it align with the way that this organization is looking to do business going forward, is looking to develop and, and, and do apps going forward, um, but it's also great uh, because it has all the other benefits that we've discussed thus far, like um, makes it easier and faster to, to deploy apps and to, to develop them as well. That's how NoSQL databases um, are addressing um, challenges that originally were, you know, opposed to relational databases. And, and I just want to tell some stories um, that I think really uh, paint the picture of what's possible with NoSQL databases and, and what are the um, business level impacts that they can have on um, your organization? So four main areas um, in which a NoSQL you know, database, particularly MongoDB, um, can really help on your businesses in enabling new types of applications that weren't possible before, improve customer satisfaction, uh, make it easier and faster to bring new products and services to market, and reducing your costs. So that's the first one. Uh, there's a Fortune 100 industrial equipment manufacturer. They hit the market and said, you, you know, this kit is becoming increasingly commoditized. It's hard for us to stick out. It's hard for us to justify why someone should buy our equipment versus someone else's. So we need to build, we need something that differentiates us. And what it did is it built a real-time analytics product for its customers. That product, what it does is it takes sensor data from the equipment and data back to a central MongoDB repository. And that data is then presented back to the user um, with some very interesting visualization and analysis. Things that help them with uh, resource provisioning and allocation, 
um, with efficient use of human resources as well, um, things that help them um, money. Unfortunately, I can't say a ton about the specific use case because it's still pretty confidential, um, but it's really some powerful stuff. In addition to that, what they're doing is they're using the sensor data that they collect to inform their own internal product development to see what aspects of the products their customers are using and taking advantage of, which aspects of the product um, are having a tendency to fail and which ones are more resilient. And they, um, is this uh, the equipment manufacturer using uh, MongoDB to deliver a new service that, that really wouldn't have been possible before? Um, because of the volume and the variety of data, as well as the speed with which it needs to ingest all that data, um, it's so so in, it, not only an externally facing app, but it's an internally facing app as well. It's well. A great example is the city of Chicago, uh, which is something called the Windy City Initiative. What they're doing is using a NoSQL database, namely MongoDB, to cut crime. It's cutting crime with MongoDB. Here's what it's doing. It's collecting and analyzing a variety of data in real time from over 30 different departments. Um, for example, it's going to uh, look at um, the number of 911 calls and complaints, number of broken streetlights, abandoned buildings, liquor permits, and patients uh, in a given area. It might determine based on it, that information that there's likely to be an increase in crime in that area and can deploy more units, more police officers to that area. Um, not only using MongoDB um, to cut crime, but also using it to improve a number of other municipal services. So this is an example of um, a type of application that really just it wouldn't have been possible before. They're collecting data in so many different forms, including geospatial data, um, and it to to do better for the city, uh, powerful. That powerful um, use case that um, I think apply not only to you know municipal and other governments, but um, can really apply to a number of organizations that are looking to aggregate data from a number of disparate sources that have typically been challenging to aggregate and something meaningful with them in real time. Customers happy. Today, actually, uh, there was a phenomenal article in GigaOM about um, how MetLife is using MongoDB. So MetLife um, built an application, an internal application called The Wall. Um, that application is uh, provides basically a 360-degree view of the customer. So um, MetLife, for those of you who know, um, has over 100 million customers, hundreds of products, uh, can be very challenging to get a single view of any given customer across all lines of business and all the times in which that customer has interacted with the business. Um, that poses a problem in terms of things like issue resolution and call center productivity. But with this new application called Wall, which integrates data from over 70 different uh, existing systems, a customer service rep or a sales rep can single view of that customer. It, it, it looks kind of like, actually, if you see the screenshots of the application, it looks kind of like Facebook or some sort of social network. Uh, but instead, the feed is all of the different interactions that a given customer has had with your business. It's phenomenal. Um, if you've ever had been on the phone with a customer service rep and they've asked you what your address was five times every time you got transferred, um, this is solving that problem. It's all, it's 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 decreasing the time to resolving issues, and it's in addition to that, provide sell opportunities for those reps. So those reps can see the products that you're interested in. They can see what parts of the website you've clicked on and products that you've looked at in the past. So it's providing you not only with an opportunity to, to decost, but also to drive new revenue. Guardian, um, a, the UK newspaper, has over 20 million users um, using MongoDB to serve to its users, dynamic content to its users in real time. So um, a little background on The Guardian, not surprisingly as it moved its business um, online, it found that um, increased user engagement was directly tied to ad revenue. 
Um, so it looked at what, what were the ways that it could increase user engagement. So what it does with MongoDB is it stores user data, things like login and, and that sort of thing, but um, click some data in what articles you've looked at and what tests you've participated in and what areas you've commented on and use that serves content that it believes will be most relevant to you. And that's really two advantages. Not only does it make me a happier reader because I'm getting to look at the content that I care about, but it also, for them, drives ad revenue because it increases my engagement. So this is all very powerful. Another example of um, dating, uh, taking in new types of data, the variety component of what we were talking about before, um, and using that data in real time to do something meaningful. Uh, time to market. So um, Intuit runs a real-time analytics platform for over 500,000 small and medium businesses. Uh, used to take it months, quarters um, to push new versions of its application out. It can do it, the dev cycles are down to a week. That is MongoDB's flexible document model. So, like we were saying before, I won't repeat too much. If you add in a new column, you want to add a new feature, you got to change the schema somehow for a relational database, that takes time. With MongoD um, and, and most NoSQL databases, you have a dynamic or a flexible schema that allows you to change the application on the fly such that the database is no longer a blocker. Sys.com, same deal. Dev from months to weeks. That's incredibly powerful. Imagine you've got users asking you for new features. You've got, uh, they could be external customers, they could be internal business users. They're asking you to change something, they're asking you to fix something. Um, the ability to make that change quickly is very, very powerful. Um, and and um, no databases are enabling that sort of agility at the data layer. The benefit we'll talk about is a lower total cost of ownership. Um, so a lot of ways in which NoSQL databases can help save companies money, and one of which is that most of them are of an open source licensing model, which is much more cost effective than um, proprietary software from companies like um, Oracle and Microsoft. Um, but it's really the ability to use uh, scale out hardware. Um, so instead of using uh, monolithic servers, we're using um, cheaper commodity servers, scale out servers. Servers. Instead of using shared storage networks, um, uh, storage networks, uh, we're using cheaper um, storage. Um, these are major drivers of cost savings. And for a tier one bank, uh, another name that that folks out there would know, but that we have to keep confidential right now, um, saving forty million dollars over five years by switching a reference data management application to MongoDB. Because uh, not only are they saving money on licensing and on infrastructure, but the time it takes them to develop with MongoDB is much less. They actually save money on development. Um, compliance, they're saving money there because uh, they're having so many operational problems with their relational database um, that they would face certain compliance standards and they would get fined. But because of the operational simplicity of MongoDB relative to what they had before, they're no longer being fined in that way. An example is a, a major travel company saving tens of millions of dollars uh, using MongoDB, uh, normally again because of the infrastructure costs and the licensing costs that we were just talking about, um, but they're saving money on backup and disaster recovery. Um, the reason is that uh, with relational database, with a relational database before, they had to store the data in so many different places because they kept having to convert from one form to another in order for it to be compatible with one system or another. They had to migrate it from X schema to Y schema to fit in this database to serve that application. So they had way more copies of the data than they do now with MongoD, where they can all store it in a variety of different formats, but in one single place. So that's saving them alone millions of dollars. So that's kind of the wrap up on NoSQL. I'll give you just a, a quick, uh, quick and dirty background on MongoDB, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, and I'd like to get to the Q and A for folks that still have questions. Um, 
So, okay, quick about MongoDB. Um, TenGen is the company behind MongoDB. We develop and support the technology. We are the only company behind MongoDB. So as with a uh, product like Hadoop, you might have a bunch of Hadoop distributors because they're licensed under Apache. That is not the case with us. We have a different type of licensing, uh, open source license, and we are the only company behind MongoDB. And if you forget nothing else um, about MongoDB, um, excuse me, if you remember nothing else about MongoDB, it should be that it's a general purpose database, it's a document database, it's open source. That's MongoDB in a nutshell. Um, we've got lots of great customers, like I just uh, told you about. Uh, we have a huge community, over 4 million downloads. Um, we're the leading NoSQL database by um, all measures that we can find. Um, we are the agile and scalable database. We sell a bunch of subscriptions um, and consulting and training and all the great things. Uh, if you'd like some more information on us, here are some links that you can explore. Um, but uh, at this point, I'd like to open the floor to the Q&A. Uh, to find in my window over here, um, and we can find questions you all have. I've got one question, which is, are these implementations primarily in the cloud or on-premises? Um, it depends. Um, a lot of folks use us uh, in the cloud. As some folks that have higher performance requirements or security requirements um, are using them on-premise, but it really varies uh, depending on the application. Um, another gentleman um, who asked about uh, Telefonica and what type of application is on the front end. Um, I don't think we would be at liberty to share that type of information. Um, and so there, been, uh, or there was an enterprise architect who asked, do we have a real case supporting the claim um, that databases or uh, again, databases would be incapable of supporting dev processes? And what is that case? Uh, so we have um, a number of customers. It's not that you can't do agile development with a relational database per se. Uh, it's just very, it can be very challenging um, for the reasons that we described before. So um, if you design your schema and then all of a sudden you decide that you want to actually start tracking new, uh, new types of information or you want to structure your data in some new way, um, it can be challenging to all of a sudden pivot that schema on its head. Um, not that you couldn't do it per se, it would just take you uh, longer and require a lot more work. So the idea is that with a dynamic schema or a dynamic data model uh, provided by MongoDB and other NoSQL databases as well, um, it's a lot more in line with how folks develop um, using the Agile method. It's about why NoSQL um, databases can scale better than a relational database. So why could a mailbox deploy on MySQL? What issues would they have had if they didn't use MongoDB? Um, and um, other questions. So, so we'll start with that. Um, so the, the reason um, it's really about horizontal versus vertical scaling. I described before with a relational database, typically you want to have all of your data um, in the database on uh, the same server. Um, and the reason is that when you need to access data in multiple tables, um, for instance, using something called a join or to, um, to uh, execute a specific transaction, um, to grab that data across multiple different servers would just 
it's it takes more time because you have to cross over the network. Um, so basically, doing those kinds of distributed, having a distributed data, relational database, is very very challenging for that reason um, because you have uh, to unify those different tables or those different rows um, in order to execute certain transactions or queries. Um, with MongoDB, that's not the case, uh, typically because the data that is accessed together is stored together. That's the way the document model works. So um, in a given document, you would have, let's say, like going back to that car example, you would have all the information about um, a given person and the cars that they own, and so you would be able, you, there would, there wouldn't, it wouldn't be a requirement that you would um, go across multiple servers to get all the information you needed for a given query. Um, why Mailbox chose, or one of the reasons why Mailbox chose MongoDB. Now, it's it's not necessarily the case that you cannot do so with a relational database. Oracle has a product called Oracle Real Application Clusters, and there are products out there for scaling MySQL. Um, there are all reasons why I wouldn't necessarily recommend folks go in that path. One of the reasons being um, that oftentimes performance can degrade as you you uh, distribute the load and the data across multiple servers with a relational database for the reasons described. Um, also, most of those features, in order to do like efficient, low administration, horizontal scaling, um, are not available out of the box. They require lots of custom work and um, and uh, operations overhead in, in order to make all that work. A question the same person is, uh, why no SQL Mongo MongoDB versus an MPP columnar type database for analytical applications. Um, it would depend. There may be there may definitely be situations in which it makes sense to use uh, still an MPP uh, database for certain types of analytics. Um, certainly, if you're storing structured data and you have predefined queries, you you know what you're planning on doing with data. It may very well make sense to use an MPP. Um, you know, their database. Uh, but in a lot of cases where you're still going to have unstructured data that doesn't fit well into a columnar database, um, that would be uh, that would be a situation in which it definitely makes sense to explore MongoDB. Someone asked a question about we're the only company behind MongoDB. How do we then think about companies like MongoLab and MongoHQ? Um, so, um, we can so. Uh, are the company that is developing the code base behind MongoDB. Um, MongoLab and MongoHQ are partners of ours. Um, for those of you out there who aren't familiar with those uh, companies, they make MongoDB available as a service, as a hosted uh, pay-as-you-go service um, for folks that don't want to manage a database layer. Um, they're partners of ours. You know, we're more than happy to have them um, as, as you know, folks uh, making the technology available to a, a wider group of people. Um, um, those are the ones driving the actual development of the technology. Another question about whether you can store binary files and Word docs. Yes, you can. Um, you can store images and, and all kinds of things. We have a technology called GridFS, also open source, um, that enables you to store pretty much anything you'd want in MongoDB. Um, another question is around whether there's a model for legacy applications integrating MongoDB with an existing relational database. Yes, absolutely. It depends on what you want to do. Um, some folks who have basically uh, wanted to migrate away from a uh, relational database for a legacy application and move it onto MongoDB, what they'll do is they'll write um, an API, like a very simple service. Uh, they'll stand up an instance of MongoDB next to the relational database. They'll have a data layer on top, a simple API that basically says, okay, if this data lives in MongoDB, go get it from MongoDB. If not, get it in the relational database and write it back to MongoDB. In that regard, they're essentially using MongoDB as a cache. And once the cache is mostly filled, because uh, MongoDB is not a, you know, an in-memory database, it's, it's a persistent database, they essentially migrate away from the relational database. Uh, that's one way. Um, another interesting use case that's come up in a number of customers um, is where they've got old legacy systems on which it's very hard to build new applications. What they do is they pull in data uh, from those different systems uh, using MongoDB. They aggregate it all in MongoDB, and MongoDB now becomes the default data store for all new application development that needs to access the data from those legacy systems. Um, MEF is a great example of 
that, but we've got a number of, of other very interesting use cases um, where folks are essentially, you know, mobilizing or, or making use of old data uh, by pulling it into MongoDB, a more flexible data store. Someone asked about the pricing for MongoDB. So MongoDB is free and open source, just to be totally clear. Uh, we offer subscriptions for MongoDB uh, uh, prize, which comes with um, you know, some extra uh, enterprise-grade capabilities around um, security and on-prem monitoring and that sort of thing, um, as well as uh, support and a commercial license. Um, the pricing for that is, um, I believe it's $7,500 per year per server. Um, so not priced on a per-core basis, priced on a per-server basis. Um, per year comes with an SLA support and uh, um, a few other things, uh, but but please feel free to try out MongoDB uh, for as long as you want for free using the open source build. Um, th that we will always remain an open source company, and there always will be um, you know a vibrant and important um, open version of MongoDB. Um, someone had a, a question about um, Cassandra. How does MongoDB compare to Cassandra? So. Um, I referred to um, a few different flavors of NoSQL databases before. Um, I said there's a document database, which is uh, MongoDB. I said there are value stores. Some examples of that would be Redis or React. Um, I also talked about wide column stores. Uh, Andra is a wide column store, uh, modeled after um, Google's Big Table was, was really the first wide column store. A couple other ones uh, would be Google Table. Um, HBase and Accumulo and a few others. Um, the way that they're different um, is again really in the in the data model. So whereas I said with MongoDB you're storing your data in JSON documents, um, with a while of store um, you're actually storing your data in what they would call call families. It's like, like a big table with group columns is that I would describe it. Um, but it's still, it's somewhere between basically a table and um, uh, a key value store. Um, the advantages uh, to something like Cassandra uh, is it's very scalable, has great write performance, um, and is, is easy to manage. Uh, like other NoSQL databases, also has um, flexible schema. The disadvantage is that. Uh, it's still not really aligned in terms of the data model with modern application development. And so my application development is typically object oriented, and that's why it aligns so well with the document model because the document is essentially an object. Um, it's not easy necessarily to map data into a wide column store, um, and uh, more importantly, it's uh, there's a steep learning curve for building applications on Cassandra. Um, so that can get a bit harder to get up and running. The last thing I would say about Cassandra um, is that while it's it's um, got a lot of things going for it in terms of the management realm, um, it's limited in terms of the query language. So one of the things that I said before about the document model in MongoDB was that they took the, flex, the, the scalability and the performance from NoSQL uh, while preserving the robust functionality of a relational database. So a lot of folks have come to expect certain things from the relational database. Rich data manipulation options, the ability to be do things like uh, compound indexes and range queries and geospatial indexes and all these other things. You lose a lot of that, most of that really, um, with uh, key value stores and um, column family stores um, like Andra, whereas you preserve that with a document store like, like MongoDB. I and mean, that's part of what allows you to to uh, do some really special things like what uh, the city of Chicago is doing, for instance, um, using MongoDB. Um, and, uh, what is a shard? Um, uh, shards are is the term for a partition of data in MongoDB. So I mentioned that MongoDB scales out horizontally. Um, so a very simple example could be that let's say I have a list of 1 through 100, and I know that I can only reliably fit 25 entries in that list on a given server. So I put entries 1 through 25 on 
on server one and 26 through 50 on server two and so on and so forth. Each of the servers would be a shard. Collectively, those shards would make up the cluster. And that sure would store all the data that I needed in lists uh, 1 through 100. I had a question um, about, so uh, in a document, you, you might have all the info about a person, click stream and name, address, order history, etc. Or would those, uh, or are different documents related? It would really depend on the application and what it's trying to do. Uh, and it would really depend on the use case. Um, in some cases, you might be storing all the information about a given person in a given document. In some cases, you might have a collection of documents about um, some basic information about the person, name, address, etc. And then you might have another place like, you know, an analytics database, your analytics MongoDB cluster that's storing the data on clickstream and other things. It, it's very use case dependent, though, so I'm sort of hesitant um, to say anything too specific on that. about whether MongoDB can re be redistributed. Um, I assume you mean like uh, through a reseller or a partner model. Um, yeah, that could be possible. Feel free to email us um, offline. Um, is this to make analytics on MongoDB or is it necessary to use an app, a specific application above MongoDB? So it really depends on what you would be trying to do. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things in MongoDB, pieces of functionality like atomic update modifiers and things like that, um, that make MongoDB great um, to support analytic applications. Um, obviously, the database itself, there needs to be an application, some sort of interface that asks the database for the information. Uh, but um, these things like atomic update modifiers, like an integrated aggregation framework, framework and integrated MapReduce do allow you to do analytics in place in the data itself. Um, general rule that I would say is for real-time analytics, I use MongoDB. For large batch-oriented offline type jobs, um, I would look at other solutions and using MongoDB in conjunction with them. So an example, uh, there's a MongoDB user that um, uses MongoDB as the real-time operational data store um, to um, track things like click streams and uh, you know, other components of online user behavior. Um, they then take that data, they funnel it into Hadoop using the MongoDB Hadoop connector. They do a bunch of analysis on that data offline. That data then piped back into MongoDB and inform things like real-time ad serving and content uh, I regard MongoDB is doing the real-time component of the analysis, but Hadoop is doing some of the offline user sessionization and that sort of thing. But in general, do you need an application server for the high volume input type applications? I'm not sure I 100% answer understand the question, but yet yeah, typically for most applications you would still need an app server of, of some sort. Um, we don't normally recommend running the app server and the database on the same server, uh, but I suppose it would depend. I mean, if it's high volume, yeah, you should probably have your app server separate from your database, um, if nothing else, just for um, redundancy. I also asked a question about um, trying from a relational database to a NoSQL database. What are the possibilities and the drawbacks, et cetera? Um, so um, a lot of folks who come to us with this question, um, it's, it's, uh, it definitely varies de depending on the organization. Um, obviously, there are tons of possibilities. Uh, I, I could you know, test those at length, um, but uh, be happy to be upfront about the, the drawbacks. Um, applications that were previously coded in SQL, you can't execute SQL queries on MongoDB. So you would have to read the queries um, for MongoDB. Um, the advantage there is that um, MongoDB is extremely easy to use and easy to learn. Um, and in fact, we have free online training available to anyone um, around the world uh, to, to train you on how to use MongoDB. Um, but one of the things that folks notice about it is that it's just so easy to use. Um, so typically you find that it doesn't take 
uh, developers very long to figure out how to use it. Um, and um, given the richness of the query language and the fact that, that it's providing you with a lot of the same functionality that you've come to expect from a relational database, it's typically not that hard um, to make that switch. Additionally, uh, because you're spinning out so much of the complexity that you used to have in a relational database that developers wanted to deal with before and they now don't have to deal with when using MongoDB, um, it tends to be oftentimes a real playable experience to make that sort of switch. So along the same vein, there's another question about what, what are the hidden costs you should be aware of and what kinds of skills do you need in-house to be able to use and sustain MongoDB? Do we need super good engineers to develop apps using MongoDB? Um, well, um, as a rule, I would say you would add engineers doing any sort of development, but I guess that's pretty obvious. Um, now, like I said, MongoDB is pretty easy to use. Uh, there aren't a ton of gotchas. There are obviously, like any technology, um, there are you know things to consider. Um, but uh, the one of the of MongoDB is really around the ease of use. Um, from the ops standpoint, uh, we find that Linux, you know, cur current DBAs and Linux admins really have no problem picking up MongoDB. Um, it's it's not it's not that complicated. You're still looking for the same types of things like index and query optimization. You're still um, you know, doing the same types of things around backups and upgrades and, and, and all that. Um, and we also have an ops best practices guide available on the website um, for download under white papers and data sheets. So for anyone who's interested in that, um, please feel free to download that um, where we outline a number of those best practices. Um, but um, a lot of folks find that um, really they can take resources that were previously uh, devoted to relational database development and use them for other projects because they don't need um, as many devoted people to develop and manage against MongoDB. So as, as an example, um, Telefonica um, was, uh, was a user data management system with MongoDB. Um, they spent 14 months with seven developers trying to build a system that ultimately didn't work. Um, and in three months, using three developers, they were able to get it to work pretty well, very well, in fact, with MongoDB. Um, so I, I wouldn't be concerned about um, about the ability to find folks um, that, that can do the development. Um, it's relatively easy to pick up, and there's plenty of uh, knowledge and resources out there uh, to ramp up your team. Some applications, uh, someone asked, what are some popular applications that use MongoDB other than the ones that I've mentioned? Uh, Foursquare uh, runs on MongoDB. Disney runs its entire gaming on MongoDB. MV serves, uh, runs all of its content management um, on MongoDB. Um, I'm going into some uh, customers I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, Craigslist, of course, uses MongoDB. Guilt Group uh, runs on MongoDB. Um, e uses MongoDB heavily. Uh, Harfax recently migrated its entire business um, vehicle data management system over to MongoDB. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, some other customers that I, pro that I probably can't talk about as much. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, but uh, like I said, my name is Graham. You can feel free to um, eat with any other questions uh, if you have them. Uh, or if, uh, my email is uh, now up there. It's gn at tengen.com. Please email me with any other questions um, on MongoDB, on something that I said in the webinar, or anything else, anything else about Tengen. Graham, thank you so much. This is a great presentation, and thanks to the attendees for being so active and with such great questions, um, some great information coming through. And to let everyone know, I will be sending out an email to everyone with links to the slides and links to the recording of the webinar. So
all of that. And I'll send a gram contact screen as well, so um, you have to scramble, write it down, and make sure you get it. Graham, again, thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to Tenjin for sponsoring the webinar, and thanks to everyone for attending. Everyone has a great day. Thank you.